Elliot, do you want to start this one? I really do. I really actually do. I'm glad you passed that to me because there is a bit of writing in this chapter that I just had to stop and like reread like three times because it was it was pretty incredible. Just words and imagery describing what's happening with with Zeth here. So I just want to read it and then we can launch into to talking about Zeth and Lyft. Zeth of the Skybreakers led the way toward the Parshman army, the child edge dancer following. Zeth feared not pain, as no physical agony could rival the pain he already bore. He feared not death, that sweet reward had already been snatched from him. He feared only that he had made the wrong choice. Zeth expunged that fear. Nin was correct. Life could not be lived making decisions at each juncture. Like that was that was just poetic. I don't I don't even know how to describe it. Like that's just a what a what a powerful description of Zeth and kind of where he's at and how he's chosen to align himself to someone because he doesn't trust himself to do it. And you can't hurt this guy because he's already been through the worst possible thing, you know, that you can imagine. He carries such a, a pain and a burden. Death is not a punishment for him. It, it's a reward. Like that I can't describe this character to, to you any better. Than that section right there. I agree. This this part gave me some chills hearing like that 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 quote you gave. Oh man, because hearing it, it's like, do you know how long I waited for some good like Zeth content? Oh my goodness, and and this is like really good because it's not just oh he's like coming around and he's doing something that's gonna help us. It's he's leading the charge, and we get to see that. I don't know. I don't know what to say other than he's the like ultimate fighter and tool for this scenario because like what does he have to lose? He he has his purpose and we've seen what he can do when he really has his like purpose or motivation or reasoning for something. And it has been pointed in right now what is a great direction for us. And he, he's got a pool of stormlight, and he has night blood. And need I say more? He's got the the mindset for it now, and the freedom. And he's got lift as backup. Like yeah, yeah, exactly. I never would have expected these two characters to like <laughs> partner up. I can say that that took me out of left field. That they're kind of like, I guess they are two like k- kind of outsiders that are. You know, on on the outskirts and still major, so it kind of adds up. But I, I definitely was not expecting these two characters to uh, be side by side. What I will say, go ahead, Elliot. Well, I, I was actually gonna while we're talking about the the lift Zeth duo, I was and and while I'm reading passages, I was gonna read another one with some of the the dialogue back and forth between the two of them, and actually the three of them because Nightblood's there too because it is. Fantastic. It starts with, let's see, we'll start here. Zeth settled down lightly beside her. I have failed to carry this burden. That's okay. Your weird face is burden enough for one man. Your words are wise, he said, nodding. (laughs) Lyft rolled her eyes. You're right, sword. He's not very fun, is he? I think he's DV anyway. Zeth did not know this word. But it sent Lyft chortling in a fit of amusement with the sword, which the sword mimicked. I, I just think the the dynamic there of Zeth is just so serious. He's so brooding. Like, oh, your words are are wise. And and Lyft, who's just like completely just goofing off the whole time. And then Nightblood just so excited to have someone to joke around with because Zeth is like so serious all the time. Is I, I was actually laughing and, and chuckling a little bit as I was reading because it was amazing. And then it goes on. Lyft has an idea and she says, well, the best way to steal something is to not steal it. And then Zeth says, these words are not as wise. (laughs) Yes. Uh. So yes, this is not the duo I expected. We, we, we theorized maybe way back in in way of Kings about, you know, some sort of hypothetical Kaladin and Zeth buddy cop movie. We didn't get that. We got the Zeth and Lyft buddy cop movie and <laughs> really it's did. everything i didn't realize i needed 
I think this, as far as intertwining our characters or our characters, like, interacting on the same, in the same environments, I, I, I think that may be my favorite thing that Brandon Sanderson has done throughout the story. All the comparisons and contrasts between our heroes and their sprint, uh, Zeth and his sword, um... There's so many applications of that, like so many. Just like the weird pairings that happen, interactions with Hoyd and all the people, interactions with Yasa and all these people. And then here we really, really see that in a lighthearted way in the midst of a lot of this with Zeth and Lyft. And I love it. I love seeing these ridiculous interactions between two very ridiculous characters. So, I. I whew, I I think as a writing or storytelling element, that is my favorite part. What I um, what I will say is there's almost No, there is. There is too much of this crammed into such little space here at the end of the book where there's so, so many of these really cool, funny moments and really epic moments just shoved back to back to back. And it's really fun to read, but it's really also easy to miss some of these because there's so many of them and it's so hard to keep track of all of them that as you're reading you're you can just feel it that you're not absorbing everything that you're reading because there's just too much to to think about as as it's going as it's going on i don't think that's necessarily a flaw but it's certainly challenging to talk about on a podcast <laughs> <laughs> that's true i i see just i i agree with that i from the point of view of me reading this, or potentially, you know, if you watch this as a movie, just any any medium of consuming this story, it doesn't seem right to me, or it doesn't seem good to, like, we're going to save all the, the really best fights and really best moments and really funniest jokes and things like that to this, like, one little part at the end of our 1300 or 1200 page book or whatever. Um, but I don't know how you incorporate these moments anytime early in our story. I don't know how you do that. So it makes sense that once they're together, they're going to have these moments. But it's like, whoa, okay. I, I was very daunted to reread this chapter. I didn't know how to reread this chapter because I was like, there are so many things in here that I'm going to have to try and organize that I don't, I don't know how to get started. It's really difficult. I just need to take a lot of next steps, I guess, as Dalinar would say. A a visual adaptation of this battle would be really challenging. In some ways, really easy. And that there's some fantastic visual scenes here that you know you can just picture what it looks like in your head just based on the description. Like when Zeth comes down and, and takes out that thunderclast and when when Dalinar is, you know, facing off in, in the red mist with the thrill. All of that very easily ad- adapted into into visual medium. But how in the world do you fit all of this into one scene of a movie and it not be an hour and a half long? I, I don't know how you could do it. I really don't. I have nothing to add. I have no idea either. <laughs> so... Lyft's conclusion of how to successfully take the King's Drop is to make them think they still have it. And so then they walk over to Shallan and say, hey, we need some help with a light weaving. And Zeth battles to get the King's Drop and then throws it to Lyft, who is in a rock, like hidden in a light weaved rock. And that's how they steal the King's Drop as they like substitute it Indiana Jones style. And throw like throw the real one into a rock so they can't see it and then that's how they deliver it to Dalinar. There's a nugget hidden in all of that as well that has me spinning some crazy theories. That there there's quite a few scenes actually where like Zeth and Lyft are bouncing the rock the the gem back and forth and and then the fused have it for a little while and then lift gets it back and then zeth has it and then zeth loses it again there, there's quite a bit of time where this thing is just bouncing around everywhere you could actually play that off almost comically i think in if you if you wanted to 
there's a bit in there that says Zeth is able to to capture the stone ultimately at one point because he has experience wielding the surge of the edge dancers. They at one point the fuse that has this power like slicks up the stone so that it's like a greased pig, right? You can't hold on to it. Zeth is ready for this. Zeth knows how to handle this because he says he has trained with all, all of the honor blades. And I know we had, we've, we've realized this before that apparently the Shin have had all of the honor blades for a while. Not only do they have them all, apparently at least Zeth has trained with all of them. So he at one point in time has wielded all of the, the 10 different surges and practiced with them. That that's crazy to me. One that Zeth has this experience, but then I start to think about like, do the, do the people of Shinovar, do the Shin just have an army of Zeths all trained on all these surges, just kind of chilling over there in Shinovar? Like, I'm now terrified about what's awaiting for us in Shinovar if we ever get there. Zeth's crusade is to cleanse Shinovar, by the way. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yikes. I I do think the the constant keep away uh spar that's going on would be a cool way to cut from from character to character like you're watching Yasna for a bit in a visual adaptation obviously and then Seth and Lift fly by with the thing and then it follows them for a little bit and then you go out to Shallan on the outside of the battlefield and then Zeth and Lift keep going and then it stops on Shallan for a bit. So it'd be a cool way to travel around the battlefield. I like that. That would be awesome. So when they finally get the King's Drop, they deliver it to Dalinar. We finally figure out why Dalinar needs it. He needs to capture the thrill. And this is split between a couple point of view segments from Dalinar, but his his moment's kind of already passed. He doesn't actually have that much content in this chapter. He embraces the thrill. He entices it with something it loves, a.k.a. him, and embraces the thrill. Lift delivers him the king's drop, and he imprisons the thrill in the king's drop at the end of the chapter. It's not clear to me. At one point, Dalinar actually comes up with this idea. Because we, we talked about before, he sends Lift and Zeth after the King's Drop, kind of just based on the notion of, hey, apparently that's really important. Maybe we should stop them from having it. But then at some point in all this, it must have clicked to him, oh, what if I can capture the thrill inside this gemstone? And then also at the same time, he has to come to this realization of, I had a conversation with Teravangian about this once, about how you do this. You have to kind of entice the spren in. And then he goes about doing that with, it even uses words like embrace and, and like welcome the thrill. So he has to fully like enter into that part of him that had that level of relationship with the thrill in order to get it to come to him. Really interesting. The moment where he realizes he needs it is right at the end of 119. Kaladin asks, uh, well, what are your orders, sir? And he looks down at his wrist and he sees the clock fabriel that Navani made him. And that's when it clicks for him. As he sees the clock fabriel, he I sees the know. gemstones on the back and says, wait, I can capture the thrill with the, that's what it's for. Is for that is is to capture Nergawul in the King's Drop. Gotcha. The interesting part too is when he does go into the thrill. You you can totally just picture him, you know, stepping into this red mist, and then he just you know kind of disappears into this cloud, the swirling cloud of terrible things. He realizes 
or he talks about how he doesn't think the thrill is actually necessarily evil. He he like has this realization that the thrill is really just this primal force, this urge. It just so happens that it's a very violent one. That the thrill is just all about Trevor, you put it in the notes, the fight. It's the, the spren of the fight. And he actually seems to think about like ways that that's been a good thing for him in the past. That the thrill could enable you to fight when maybe you should fight. But it just is so easily used as a tool of evil, and that's what Odium has done. But this idea that the thrill isn't necessarily evil itself, I'm not sure that I fully by that, but I was following Dalinar's train of thought. There's a here, I'll link it for you guys. Oh, and I will put it on screen now. There's a really good visual for this from Verlebird on Twitter. And you can see it on, on your screens now. And there's a really good visual. There's there's oh, yeah. a lot. There's gemstones scattered on the floor that and he's about to walk in with to the thrill alone. Like that's one of my favorite artworks for That's super dope. That makes me wish I was a very talented artist. I am nowhere near that sort of uh I mean y'all seen my handwriting, so <laughs> you guys see <say> more. <laughs> All right. Adolin and Renarin actually battle into the city, farther into the city from the wall, and they get th stopped by the Thunderclast. And if only Zeth could spare 20 seconds to come eat the Thunderclast with Nightblood, but he's he's busy. So they actually make a meal of this, uh, this fight, and Adolin has to run up and down the city trying to fight it with his blade which we talked about a little bit last week, but we get a name for his shard blade. And we get an action from his shard blade in Shades Bar last week. What is happening? I'm wondering, I'm really starting to wonder if Adolin is like, awakening the spren of his sword. We know that the spren of his sword is is dead. There's kind of that whole potentially ethical dilemma of is it okay to wield a dead spren as a weapon in battle? <clears throat> and Adolin is like taking making an effort to appreciate what he's doing and realize and understand that he's has a a spren in his hand and he's he's reaching out to her and then we get these moments where she like responds there was the moment where she saved him from the fused in shadesmar and then here where she kind of mentally reaches out to him and shares her name i'm wondering if this is steps along a path towards a scene similar to kaladin reawakening sill when sill was dead is Adolin going to perhaps be able to like bring this this Spren back from the the dead or the, the the version of dead that that Spren have and maybe like form his own radiant style bond with this Spren perhaps? I was thinking this ever since well, one kind of ever since the beginning. Like, can this Spren be brought back? Um, and especially since the Spren helped save Adolin, right? Like, that's some form of connection or some kind of... Either that there is a bond there that is stronger than we may have thought, or there's been a growth in there that's some development um, that a bond is growing somehow. So I see that as a very, very real option at this point and i would i would love to see that that would be really cool he also breaks the 10 heartbeat rule in this 
uh, in this chapter. I don't know if you guys caught it, but he he's running from the Thunderclast and he calls out to Maya because he needs the sword immediately and he, he summons her on the seventh heartbeat. So whatever that means for the the revocations here, but and keep in mind alive alive spren blades don't need that rule. Um, right. as as Sil explained to us, is that they they're just instant. That that's part of what's feeding into my my thoughts here is, we know dead spren take ten seconds to summon and alive spren take zero. Is is this Maya awakening like coming back in that she's allowing Adolin or being able to appear in less time, perhaps. We get possibly the first moment for Renarin to really shine in a in a really physical battle way. He comes up to Adolin fighting this Thunderclass, heals him for a second time, by the way. Shout out to the younger brother always being there to heal the older one. And he fights the Thunderclass and Adolin leaves to go help the rest of the city. And him and his friend Gliss have a kind of interesting way to solve the the Thunderclass. Did you guys catch how they finally kill it? I was trying to I was trying to process exactly how they did it. I wasn't really sure because it's almost like it's almost like a banishment almost. He Gliss, the the spren is like telling Renarin you you can do this. You can scare away. They they talk about light being an important part of it. And then Renarin just kind of like stands up, summons a bunch of light, and then the thing like the light dies inside of the, the thunderclass. It's like the the spren, the fused dish spren like leaves the thunderclass. It's like Renarin just kind of commanded it and it left. Yeah. He he summons a great amount of stormlight and it and the thunderclass basically gives up. And it was it was afraid of him to start, so it knew he had the power to start with that. And then Renarin figures that out with Gliss. So whatever's happening with his spren, we still don't know. Uh, there's something good happening at least. And I'm trying to figure out: Can Renarin do this because he's a Night Radiant, like any Night Radiant could do this? Can he do this because he's a Truth Watcher, or can he do this because he's got like a corrupted? spren within him like what what one of his three potential sources of of power here is, is causing this because the the thundercrest yeah seemed to recognize it immediately but i'm not sure why once he finishes the thundercrest he goes up to the oath gate and there's 12 fused just sitting right on top of the oath gate which i love this visual there's there's 12 feet like the oath gates on the top of the city i don't know if i should probably show paul that map that elliot has of the thalen city some at some point but the oath gates at the top of the city in the ancient ward and there's 12 fused just hovering over it and renarin says all right i'm gonna go take it back and everybody kind of just looks at him and then lets him go and renarin kind of treasures that moment for himself of well, everybody in my entire life has said, no, you can't do that, Renarin. You're, be sensible, Renarin. You're, you, you're not allowed to do that type of thing. And nobody stops him. And he walks out, and he's about to take these 12 fused by himself. And then he gets a vision of the Oath Gate exploding from your ethereal. And who opened it? Teft. Night Radiant Teft. He has sworn his third ideal. He's got his shard spear, and he summons it from right behind the 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 fuse protecting it. Not only that, Trevor. I want to expand a little bit with Renarin. He he also mentions how, or he's thinking to himself, right, about how he doesn't freeze up when he goes in or whenever he's heading in because he's always frozen up. And today, he doesn't know if it's been cured or anything like that. He just knows he has, like, the confidence to take 
this situation, which is 12 fused, which we can't look over, that Kaladin struggled so much initially, if y'all remember, to kill one fused. And that was like the first time a fused had been killed by the people, at least where, where they were. And, and so that's like a humongous deal. It's like a death wish, really, like for most of our heroes. So I, I think this is incredible, and I'm. I love Renarin. R- Renarin is incredibly brave. Incredibly brave. The way he faces down the, the Thunderclash and then this moment here. Yeah, the comparison to Kaladin is great. Kaladin's out on the battlefield right now, struggling to face, you know, four or five fused. And Amram's there too. We'll talk about it in a little bit. But yeah, for Renarin to walk into up against 12 fused, it, it's the same as Renarin with his blood weakness or whatever they call it, jumping into the ring to go save his brother Adolin when he knows full well he's going to die. And he does it anyway. Like that that's the Renarin that we love for sure. I remember when we talked about that, you you mentioned the word's favorite character potentially back in back in that duel scene. So he he's got the heart on him. All right, and last but not least, Kaladin. We've been waiting for this Kaladin Amaram showdown for since the end of part three of The Way of Kings, when Amaram backstabs quite literally Kaladin and his men. Kaladin saves Amaram from Helleran, Shalon's brother. Amaram offers Kaladin the shard blade. Kaladin refuses it. And then Amram takes it from him forcibly, even though he didn't need to. Kills all of his men. And here we are. Amram is swallowing a gemstone at the beginning of this scene. And Elliot, we talked about this late in the last episode of last week, that this is Yelignar, the the unmade that overcame Asudon and Kolinar. And as this fight progresses, where does the line stop between Amaram and Yelignar? Who's who's in control here? I want to talk about this for a second. Um, right before we talk about who's the control when, we see that Amaram has decided to swallow this gemstone now. It took him a little while to do this, at least from what I understand. And I wanted to point out that whenever he is given the gemstone and Odium is kind of like, here's my end of the bargain, you can swallow this and just hope it doesn't destroy you like it did with that queen and wherever it was. Uh, Kolinar. Kolinar, yes. Um, <laughs> that made me think that uh, going into this, I thought we were going to have a form of Amram redemption, or may- maybe like an opportunity provided to turn away from ODM, right? Or, you know, join join the good side. And I thought that was going to turn into Kaladin's fourth ideal of kind of like trying to save like an enemy or something like that. Right. Um, even even the one he hates the most, more than anything. Like, if Kaladin was given the, like, two free blows on someone, and, and he has the choice, you know, he could kill Odium and Amram. I feel like he would choose Amram twice. Like, he, <laughs> he just, like, he, there's nothing, there's no bigger enemy in his mind than Amram. Everything that he's embodied from the very beginning has he blames on Amram. He blames Tien's death on Amram as well. So. Mm-hmm. Enti- yes, entirely, and so much stuff. Um, and so I thought that was going to kind of be the like a enormous pinnacle moment, uh, which didn't happen, but it was still really incredible. But I did have a th- yeah. I-, I was thinking that because whenever Amram is first presented with Yelignar. At least from the audiobook perspective, it seemed like he was 
wary or not excited about it. And it seemed like this was kind of his last resort. He was like, well, things are really going crazy. I guess we'll do this and stuff. So I am not defending Amram, but I am in no way defending Amram. But uh, it did seem less convincing that he was like really, really malicious the until the end yeah the order of operations there is important because when dalinar summons his perpendicularity he turns to amram and offers his amram's way out he's he tells him you 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 can change i changed you you can overcome this and amram says no and then swallows the gemstone so amram fully conscious makes his decision and another nail in the coffin for me is Amram talks about how he's spoken with Odium before. He's he's made a deal. This was a what's the word I'm looking for? Preconceived, premeditated. This was a premeditated betrayal. It was not a I'm feeling the Im- influence of the thrill. Sure, I'll go with you. Amram intended to do this. He struck a deal with Odium. I will turn to your side if you give me the power. And then Yelignar is the power that he's been rewarded with. Is it still Amram by the end of like what they're doing? Eh, I, I don't know. But even the Amram at the beginning, I'll, I'll condemn him pretty quick for that premeditated betrayal. The worst... The the thing that gets me under my skin the most in this chapter is he tries to take credit for Kaladin's uh, accomplishments as they're fighting. He he accuses Kaladin of being weak, and the, the actions I gave you, I I gave you the motivation to get where you are today. I, I want to read it. I made you, Kaladin. Amram's red eyes lit the crystals that rimmed his face. I gave you that granite will, that warrior's poise. This, the person you've become, this was my gift. A gift at the expense of everyone I loved. Why do you care? It made you strong. Your men died in the name of battle, so that the strongest man would have the weapon. Anyone would have done what I did, even Dalinar himself. Didn't you tell me you'd given up that grief? Yes, I'm beyond guilt then why do you still hurt? Amram flinched. They fight a little bit, and Kaladin wins. Kaladin floated down towards him. Ten spears go to battle, he whispered, and nine shatter. Did that war forge the one that remained? No, Amram. All the war did was identify the spear that would not break. I took a little bit out of that that that's kind of encouraging to me that the whole metaphor with the spears is really cool and, and I I took away from it it doesn't it doesn't require a tragedy for someone to be strong the the strength was there to begin with the tragedy just reveals it is kind of what Kaladin is getting at here the spear was strong it just took an incredibly difficult scenario to show that that spear was the strength. And so basically Kaladin's rebuttal there basically saying, no, Amram, you don't have any claim to making me strong. I'm with that. I agree with him. So I I have two thoughts. One is just how like, devious that is with Amram. I think that is like one of the lowest digs you can go, especially for someone who cannot stand, like wants to kill you more than anyone else in existence. Like <laughs> um, to, to talk about like, I made you, you are who you are today because of me. Right. And it's, I, how dare you you know like yeah so i said i was going into this with the thought like oh kaladin may speak the fourth ideal and he forgives amaram and it's like a good thing and i was like you know 
we we kind of need the satisfaction of like this fight just getting to watch Kaladin win this fight like it's a humongous deal it really is um and so i'm i'm very happy with how this went and it was just such a well written fight scene and really cool and we kind of see the shift from amaram to yelignor which like was also really exciting or just like really wild imagery and the part i skipped there was in my opinion where the def- definite ship shift between amram and yelignar is because kaladin keeps accusing him of why do you still hurt or asking him why do you still hurt and he, he asks him like three or four times and each time amram surrenders his hurt to odium and yelignar comes for- forward more his carapace starts breaking his shard plate and his eyes start you know becoming void bringer and yelignar is just the the visual imagery here is phenomenal he amaram is fighting with two shard blades Oathbringer in one hand helleran's blade in the other both of these blades are very personal to kaladin for two different reasons and he's becoming the unmade as as he's fighting this he's being named just to lash him, to to use other surge binding abilities, and it just escalates and escalates until Kaladin finally wins. Elliot, you seem to be brewing over there. I I am brewing over here because I want to draw I want to draw a comparison back to Dalinar here. This is the part of Amram that I now compare to what Dalinar just did. Like you said, Amram is trying to shift the blame here. He's saying, no, this is not my fault. This is not my fault. Odium, take my pain. The opposite of what Dalinar did. And, and Kaladin's question is really telling. Why do you still hurt? Amaram, the one who is supposedly giving his pain to Odium, is the one who still hurts. And Dalinar, the one who took all his pain into himself, owned it and took responsibility for it, is the one who achieved forgiveness and was able to move on past his pain. That difference is huge. I totally agree. I was going to say, so I, I had one other point I wanted to make, and it's kind of like a, it's very rare that I, like, really make a connection from another story, like, like a story completely external from anything we've ever talked about. But I really could not shake how we see Dalinar and Amram with... For any of our watchers, I don't know if you've seen or read or whatever, but I can't stop thinking about Les Mis. Um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with that's the storyline at all, but we have kind of our two characters of Jean Valjean and uh, Javert who Jean Valjean at the beginning of the story is kind of given this scenario or at least an internal dialogue and struggle of do I deserve to move on from this life of like slavery and bondage and and, like things that have held me back when I does like technically deserved like a punishment or to you know to be confined or can I choose life and Jean Valjean chooses life or a new life um and then at the end of the movie or end of the the story javert is kind of faced with a similar thing of he's kind of being faced with what i've known to chase and what i what i've basically focused on isn't right but i can move on i can choose life but he chooses death and i could not help but draw that comparison and think about that uh, maybe it's because I watched that, uh, the movie adaptation, at least, of that story um, a couple weeks ago. But, yeah, I couldn't help but think of, like, two characters who are very, like, prominent that are presented with, like, basically the same internal struggle and choose very different outcomes. I love it. That was a great parallel. Yeah. I didn't know where you're going with that at first, but I, I'm on board yeah. now. I understand. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was like a little, you know, comp- comparing a musical to uh, to the end of Oathbringer. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of funny, but... You should yeah. just make Stormlight into a musical. Yeah, well, oh, we yeah. could do that. Yeah. Pattern would be a great singer. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The end of this battle. Kaladin doesn't kill Amaram. Rock kills Amram. It is incredibly important for Kaladin that he doesn't kill Amram, and it's because of his protect ideals, which is actually why Words of Radiance was rewritten, the end of Words of Radiance, when he kills Zeth versus fatally stops Zeth, and Zeth chooses death himself. Um, But... Rock comes out of the city and does the dirty work for Kaladin and breaks his peace vow that that Rock has had since as long as we've known him. There's a couple things to unpack here. First of all, Kaladin. When I first read this, I was a little upset that Kaladin was robbed of this final revenge on Amaram. But of, of, of course, Kaladin's character is not supposed to take it, right? He's supposed to let Amaram live. But Rock identifies that this is no longer Amaram. Amaram is dead. At the, at this point, Amaram is dead, and Rock is killing a fused, is what or an unmade, I should say. And it, Rock identifies that, and Kaladin probably would not have. So, what are your guys' thoughts on this? I was actually wondering if because it's an unmade and it's some sort of force of evil or i guess maybe that's up for debate i was wondering if that it like allowed rock to not necessarily break his vow of of peace or or nonviolence. like is is you know rock stopping a force of nature from killing kaladin is that the same as him killing a person and is amram even a yeah a person at this point i i don't have any you know theories in that area i was just kind of wondering But I did love this moment when when we find out it is Rock who steps in at this moment to save Kaladin and wields a shard bow to do it. Barehanded. Without shard plate, which we've been led to believe is not supposed to be physically possible. But we also know that Rock is a horn eater. He's big. He's strong. He's also imbued with stormlight. Yeah, he's glowing, so. Either way, pretty awesome. Do you, do you think Kaladin should have had the finishing blow, Paul? That's what we as the reader want, right? We like that's what I wanted. I, I say we as the reader. I guess I can't generalize for what everyone is feeling, but I wanted that to happen, yeah. But in the grand scheme of things, understanding like this, the bond that Kaladin has, it makes sense. Like I'm not upset about the outcome, um, but it's not what I was expecting. Anything else? <sighs> okay. Now. We have two more chapters in the book. Next week, we will be finishing Oathbringer by Brandon Sanderson. Ooh. Now, Finally. there's a couple things that I want, just quick five minutes here at the end here, I want to get your guys' input on. A couple things we haven't checked off the list. We need a Dalinar Hoyd therapy session. Mm. Yes? Yes. We need an in-world Oathbringer book book right because the other two were books right what is going to be included in this book in these last two chapters any hypotheses any what what, what's coming before the end of the book before we get to rhythm of war therapy session is not happening that is happening in the next book because as we've seen our hoid therapy sessions come 
a book later. Like, we have the Kaladin one in Words of Radiance. We have the Shallan one in Oathbringer. So I don't think we're going to have that with Dalinar. Okay. Um, I feel like we were going to... I thought we were going to have... Find out who the culprit that killed the Bridge 4 guy is. Yeah, there's, there's, I feel like that's pressing and not that relevant past this book. There is some damage so back I at your theory like... that we have to settle. That yeah, that is true. So I'm I'm guessing that that will happen. Um, what I'm I guessing, would... I I'm get so a, a loose end we need to tie up that I'm guessing we won't in the next two chapters is Teravangian. Teravangian orchestrated the whole. Hey, everyone's gonna turn on you, Dalinar. Poor guy, sorry, I'm kind of sacrificing you for the greater good. Dalinar won out in the end of that. So now what does Teravangian do? How does this play into his whole diagram thing? How is he gonna view this and what does he do next? What else is out there? <clears throat> Our heralds. Our heralds are just kind of chilling now. With is, the group, is Yasna going to turn around and stab them both? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I forgot that was the thing. I would like some. I would like some Zeth and Dalinar dialogue. I would like for Zeth to be like, "Hello, Dalinar. It's nice to formally meet you and introduce myself. Uh, I am at your service." So, <laughs> you know, or or some kind of ground laid there. Um. Do you think we're going to see anything else with Nail? Is he going to be like, no, the parsh, the, the fused are right, and try to push back against them? I think that'll again be next book. I think that's going to be... That's fair. You know, now, that, now that Zeth is on the team, I'm hoping we'll, we'll see some more of him and get to see some you know, more, a little more regular point of view from Zeth, and maybe that'll be a bit of his... You know, plot line in the next book is how does how does Zeth and Nail get along now? I don't know if this changes your guys' theories at all, but between Oathbringer and Rhythm of War, there's an in-world one-year time skip. Oh. Okay. So how much do we immediately need to tie up is my question. A lot. My heart tells me we need to know where the Windrunner Arnor Blade is, but honestly, we don't need to. I'm sure the person will, like, someone will show up with a Windrunner Arnor Blade, and it was probably Moash. Just another reason to hate the guy. <laughs> I think we talked about that before, and he wasn't recognized. Whatever, yada yada yada. But I that. That does change my thoughts, actually. I was assuming we were going to pick this up right where we left off and we'd have these other you know, plot points to, to, to chase immediately starting. If we're going to skip forward, we do have more to wrap up than, than I thought we did in these last few, few pages. It's, it's uncharacteristic because so far, Words of Radiance happens you know, the day after the Way of Kings and Oathbringer happens the day after Words of Radiance. You're like, this, is, this is new territory. Okay, we do have one more episode to talk about next week, and I'll talk about this more when we get there. We'll be doing the closing two chapters and the epilogue next week. The week after that, we will be talking about Oathbringer as a whole, like we've done the last couple books as well. After that, we will be taking a short Stormlight break and reading some novellas out of Arcanum Unbounded. We have a couple... Arcanum Unbounded journeys to go on and some things to learn about the Cosmere before we can open Rhythm of War. So we'll be doing that for a couple weeks and then reading Dawn Shard, which is a novella between um, Oathbringer and Rhythm of War, which will take us two weeks. And then we will be jumping back into Rhythm of War. So about a week, or sorry, about a month between, um, between Oathbringer and Rhythm of War. It won't be a full warbreaker book 
between Words of Radiance and Oathbringer. But before we do that, we do have to finish the book first. Any closing thoughts on this episode? I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted reading this. I'm exhausted talking about this. I'm exhausted having experienced this story, but it's a it's a contented exhausted. That was that was quite the experience going through this. And I loved having you guys to to chat with about this. I think if it had just been me on my own reading a book like I normally do, I would have been very confused and being able to process this with you guys has has been a, a really enjoyable way to to read through a very epic journey that this was the motivation for the podcast i read this these chapters and i'm like i need to talk about this with somebody please and then i begged everyone i knew to pick up these books and you guys did and here we are was it worth the like two and a half year wait because you spent like a year trying to get me to read the books and then <laughs> and then a year and a half of us reading the books absolutely the journey is always worth the destination <laughs> paul okay we well go. said. Thank you for joining me, Paul and Elliot. We will reconvene next week. See you later. Boom, roasted. <laughs>